Welcome to Norwich Cathedral. I'm Jane Hedges, the Dean here, and we're delighted that you're joining us for the second in our current series of Science in the Café, Dippy is Coming. As we prepare for the arrival in January of Dippy, the Diplodocus from the Natural History Museum, we hope that you will join us as we explore how science and faith interact with each other and how we as human beings make moral choices about the way that we use our knowledge and the resources available to us. In our first session, the presentations and following discussion focused on how, as a community, we decide on the allocation of resources into healthcare and how decisions are made about distribution and equity of delivery. Tonight, we move on to think more specifically about blood and organ donation, discussing the responsibility we each have to contribute to this medical resource. We will hear first from Professor Mark Wilkinson from the Norwich Medical School, and then from Dr Lorna Williamson, the former Medical and Research Director of NHS Blood and Transplant. Their contributions will be followed by a reflection from the Reverend Canon Dr Peter Dole, our Canon Librarian, and then there will be a general panel discussion. So first of all, we welcome Mark. Thank you, Jane. Um, and as Jane said, welcome to our second conversation, this time discussing um, issues of blood and tissue donations. One of the things I'd like to point out is that we're very happy to receive comments. And so if you have anything you feel would be useful or interesting to share, please feel free to send it to the email address on the slides. And uh, we will review those regularly and publish a kind of summary come update of the discussions on the cathedral website. Uh, when we're thinking about the donation of blood and tissue, organs, um, I'm going to concentrate at first on the discussion of a blood donation, something which we can all do in theory um, and which is minimal pain and a minor inconvenience. And in this country, we donate blood through altruism. In everyday language, that is, you do something because it's the right thing to do. And if we go back, this is obviously a slide from my presentation last time, the geese flying in a skein across the sky, what is it that motivates one of the geese to take over the lead role? And this is something which has actually been a discussion point for evolutionary scientists from a few years after Darwin produced The Origin of Species. Um, and this discussion came out quite extensively. Why is it that an animal will choose to do something? And the evolutionary biologists produced this theory of an evolutionary or biological altruism. The species survives better if there is a altruistic driver and so while an individual might take a disadvantage, the species benefits. But what is it for that individual animal that makes the difference? And it's thought that it was partly about peer pressure. It may have been about getting a better mate if you are seen to be a better member of community. And the sense of reciprocity. Uh, I think there is a, something else that we miss out. Doing something altruistic makes you feel good. I can remember the first time I donated blood. Um, I'd been at university for a whole four weeks. It was the first time I donated. And I just walked a bit taller and felt a bit better about myself after I'd given blood. And I reinforced that every time I donated blood until medical reasons prevented me from donating anymore. And actually, when I was turned away, I felt lessened by being unable to donate blood anymore. Not, you know, I didn't feel terrible, it just felt a little bit diminished. I was less of a contributor to society. And so I think on a personal level, that immediate sense of being a little bit more special or whatever is a driver for altruism. It makes us want to do it. But when we look at the donation of blood, on a worldwide scale, 
it is clear that altruistic donation is not enough to meet the growing need for plasma in medical work. And plasma is one of the most valued or valuable products of blood transfusion. So an alternative way of looking at it is that we actually all see the donation of blood as part of an insurance scheme. Insurance, a cooperative device where everybody within a group, often self-selected, pays in and then when the awful thing happens to one individual, the whole group share the expense. We all insure our homes, most of us would not claim on that insurance. But if we have to, we know that the money will be available. And in the early days of insurance, that's exactly how it worked. The insurance companies would insure your house against fire. They would employ the firemen who would turn up to s if your house is on fire, but they'd only get their water out and put it out if you had the plaque that said you'd paid up for the service. If not, they went home and you had some cinders to live in. And if we look at most European healthcare systems, they work on a system of insurance. You pay to an insurance company. It's actually compulsory by law that you have to be insured, but it's managed through an insurance system. In the UK, we have this illusion that we have an insurance system because we call the specific component of our tax national insurance. Actually, it just goes into general taxation, and general taxation funds the health service. But we still talk of it in terms of insurance. If one analyzes critically what that means, if we really used an insurance scheme to cover health and blood donation, you can imagine you need blood, the doctor comes rushing, the first question is, are you a blood donor? You say yes, and you get the blood. You say no and you get the next best alternative, which is going to be suboptimal care. So could we really face the idea that we ran our blood donation system as an insurance policy? No, I think all of us would find it unacceptable to not give the best possible care just because somebody didn't give blood. I certainly would, because I'm not allowed to give blood anymore, so I would have to answer no, even though I have in the past donated. And that leaves us with the third alternative, a commercial transaction. And this is the real word, real world. We can store blood for 10 years. In America, if you give a donation of blood, you get $35. It's not a huge amount of money, but it's, you know, for some people, that's a big income. In Germany, it's 27 euros. If I was going to go for the system, me, I'd move to Italy straight away. You get a day off work, on average worth 150 euros, funded by your employer, who one imagines has to pay for that extra day's annual leave. But in real financial terms, 2016, that was almost 24 billion dollars. And within a couple of years, we'll be approaching 45 billion dollars, a huge amount of money by anybody's book. Despite the fact that this much money is being spent at the moment, the World Health Organization, I think apart from perhaps in the mind of the current American president, um, one of the forefront of the thinking end of medical care, the World Health Organization, they wish to move towards 100% of altruistic donation because they say that that is the only foundation for a safe and sustainable blood supply. They don't quite explain exactly how this can be achieved, but that's an ideal they're aiming for. They say that this is because paying for plasma preys on vulnerable populations. And I think that's right. I can imagine that it's not the wealthy piece of people in the Hamptons who donate blood and get $37 in America. It's the disadvantaged, it's the poor, it's the homeless who, for whom this is a life and death decision because they need the money to survive. And so we are preying on the impoverished, the disadvantaged in society. However, we know that altruistic donation is not enough 
to meet the world's needs. So there's this competitive thing between the real world where we pay for it and the ideal world that we'd all like to live in of altruistic donation. Once we move on to organ donation, the same sort of discussions apply, but we bring in third factors. And remember that the majority of organs donated and transplanted in this country are cadaveric. We each hope that we will never be asked whether or not a relative's organs can be used for donations, and we will all have to face our own inner demons and inner choices if we are asked that. If we go back again to last time, where we discussed the conventional current thinking on medical ethics, the ethics of healthcare, as described by Beecham and Childress, we have this pillar called justice, which I described in the way that it is usually understood, meaning the same is given to everybody. Andy Jones, my colleague from the medical school, presented an alternative view, which was justice, which means everybody gets what they deserve. And I fear that for a lot of people, that may be an instinctive understanding where donation, and we see it particularly in liver donation, comes into play. In the case of liver donation, from the time it became acceptable and straightforward, there was a debate as to whether we should deprioritize alcoholics because somehow people felt that being alcoholic was a lifestyle choice, not a disease. Personally, I think it's a disease. But there was a feeling amongst society, or amongst some people within society, that perhaps these people who have got liver failure from alcohol use should have a less priority for liver transplant. And the system took a real hit with George Best, a very high-profile recipient of a liver transplant who started drinking less than a year and a half after that transplant and ultimately died as a result of his ongoing alcohol abuse. And it's interesting that following that, staff at the Freeman Hospital in Newcastle said that they saw a fall by a third in their uh, people being willing to donate organs uh, after the death of a loved one. That is a massive hit for a service which is already failing to meet the needs of the system. What's more interesting and more striking is that relatives began to want to put conditions on donation. I would like my organs to only be given to somebody who is suitably deserving, not an alcoholic. And that, of course, is a very dangerous slippery slope because the next decision would be to make a decision based on ethnic origin, financial value, political opinion, whatever. A very dangerous slippy, slippery slope, but somewhere where we're all going. So what I try to do is give a, an approach, a discussion of the three approaches to the donation of organs or tissue in the form of blood and of organs. I've now touched upon paying for organ donation. Um, and left you hopefully with some thoughts, some comments, and some very powerful feelings about this. Um, and I say again, I'd be really grateful if you have any comments you'd like to make, if you email them into me, and I will keep the discussion going using the Cathedral website sending the link to anybody who sends in an email. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, as Jane mentioned in her introduction, uh, I'm Lorna Williamson, and I used to be medical and research director with NHS Blood and Transplant, which is the bit of the NHS responsible for providing blood to all hospitals in England and organs to the whole of the UK. So I thought I would share with you some of the issues which have come up in my practice over the years. So blood, as we all know, is necessary for life. And to Charlie and his colleagues in casualty, and to people like me, it's a medicine. 
and it's a medicine without which the NHS could not function. So I've listed on the slide some of the things it's used for, cancer treatment, heart surgery, transplantation, premature babies, etc., etc. And actually accidents are only account for a small percentage of that usage. So it's a life-giving medicine. But it's not a neutral substance. It's not aspirin or Panadol. And at the bottom of the slide, you'll see some of the ways that blood crops up in our use of language. So it's very loaded, isn't it, with cultural connections, relatives, blood brothers, lifeblood, blue blood, blood money, the bad side, blood sports, you will have views on that, and so on. And you can think of many more. So it's not neutral. Now, Mark talked about plasma, but I'm really going to talk about the red stuff as it comes out of your arm. In most developed countries, this is still a voluntary activity. And I would draw your attention to the pelican on the slide, an image which is the logo of the blood services of Ireland and the Netherlands. And this refers to the self-sacrificing nature of the pelican, plucking its own breast to provide blood to nurture its babies. So blood donation, though it's perhaps not the most demanding thing you will ever do in your life, is seen nevertheless as some act of self-sacrifice. And luckily in the UK, we have enough blood for the NHS to do all the things that it wants to do with it. And I suppose the question now then is, is such a voluntary system going to be sustainable in the decades to come? In most so-called developed countries, we have what's called the grey tsunami, folk like me, an ageing population who are placing more and more demands uh, on health care. At the moment, only one in 20 people donate blood regularly. And the birth rate is falling, so there will be fewer young people to replace the donors who retire on grounds of, of ill health. Although there is no upper age limit, interestingly, for blood donation. So it is perfectly possible that in decades to come, uh, demand or the healthcare system's need for blood will outstrip the number of people who are willing to turn up and donate. And that raises a very interesting question as to what an appropriate reward uh, is going to be in the future. At the moment, it's tea, biscuits and badges, more or less. We used to give out crystal vases to people who'd given 25, 50, 75 donations. But after a consultation with donors, they said, no, don't waste your money doing all of that stuff. Just thank us. They come in for lunch now and again and um, there's some presentations, but the material value of uh, what they take home has plummeted and they're very happy. Um, the beer, Guinness, lunch, etc., uh, are, are things that are given or have been given in blood services across Europe. But of course, there is the considerably tricky question of are we going to follow the plasma industry in offering money for the good red stuff? where at the moment, as Mark said, what you walk out with is a feeling that you've done something really useful and now you're a little hero for the day because you've given blood. The last image on the slide takes me into the next problem, which is blood grouping and the imbalance between what we have amongst donors and what is needed in the NHS. And this is particularly brought home uh, on this slide uh, thinking about a disease called sickle cell anemia, an inherited disorder of the red blood cell, where the cells, instead of being round and easily transportable through the circulation, take on this, this sickle shape um, and sludge up, basically, in the small blood vessels all around the body. And as you may have worked out from the images on the right, this is a disease of people from black African heritage. Uh, it's a very nasty condition. Uh, the acute attacks are treatable with transfusions, but more importantly, they are preventable with regular transfusions, sometimes exchanging the donor's blood with that of the patient. 
And this is where the imbalance of need comes in, because blood groups are not distributed evenly around the globe. People of black African heritage are much more likely to be blood group B than Caucasians, 18% versus 8%. But at the moment in the UK, only 1% of donors are themselves black. So what should our response be as a society? Should we say to the 8% of blood group people, blood group B people, you're just gonna have to give more to, to help the sickle cell patients? Or the other option is to use group O, which is a, un a universal blood group, and take more from the group O population. Is that reasonable? Is that appropriate? Um, luckily, um, a campaign has arisen to uh, recruit no fewer than 40,000 black donors, to some extent spearheaded by the B Positive Gospel Choir, led by an extraordinary guy called Colin Anderson, who's in the, in the little picture. Colin's a scientist in one of our blood centres in London. He's a highly skilled and expert gospel singer. And the B Positive Choir consists of people who themselves have sickle cell anemia, or they have a family member who has it, or they, are, they work for the blood service. And you may have seen them because they reached the final of Britain's Got Talent, I think in 2018. Uh, and their song was very clever. It was called Rise Up. And it had two messages. One is, all right, we have sickle, but we're going to rise up and overcome this affliction. But there was also that message, rise up, get off the sofa, get out there and donate blood if you're black and maybe you'll be group B and you'll be able to help us. A really positive response to a tricky situation. My last point on blood is, a, is, a, is another tricky one. Uh, in the past, we collected a lot of blood in prisons and that was seen as giving prisoners an opportunity to return something to society, perhaps, um, to atone, an act of redemption, all of those things. But unfortunately, the virus risk in the prison population became unacceptably high and the practice had to be stopped. But uh, the current debate uh, was, is more around, do we have to go to every last village in the whole of the United Kingdom in order to give every local society the opportunity to give blood? Why would you not? Well, it can be very expensive to go to the furthest corners of the Scottish Highlands, for example. And if you go out to some of the Scottish islands, the weather may close in and you'll be stuck there for a week. So is there an obligation to give every citizen the opportunity to give blood or not? A tricky one. So if you think blood has raised some complex issues, let's move on to organs. Now, 95% of people in surveys would say that they would accept an organ transplant if it was going to save or greatly improve their lives. But the same is not true about organ donation. And the background is that we have a waiting list for transplants. Unfortunately, COVID has increased that waiting list because transplants were suspended for many months. There are now 6,700 on that waiting list. And sadly, every day, someone will die. Today, Monday, someone will die. Tomorrow, Tuesday, another person. Wednesday, somewhere else, all waiting for an organ. And it wasn't really getting any better. We've had an organ donor register in this country for 20 years. Four million people are on it, but it's not a living will. You can be on the register, but if you die under circumstances where organ donation is possible, till recently, your family could override that wish. It was not a living will. So after a great deal of consultation, in 2015, Wales changed the law and said to the population, OK, you choose. You join the register to opt in. You join the register to opt out. If you do neither, we will conclude that you are agreeable. And that's called deemed consent. Your consent will be assumed. And this became known as Max and Kira's law. Sadly, Kira, the little girl on the right, died in an accident, and her heart was donated to young Max on the left. And the families together um, drove some beginnings of a consultation exercise, a discussion that went on for many years, 
in, in different parts of the UK at different rates to have the law changed. Wales went first five years ago, and in England the law changed in May of this year, 2020. But of course, in the middle of COVID, not much could really be done about it. Now, I could try and explain it all to you, but if this animation works, this will do a much better job. So let's bring up the animation. So, there you are. An interesting change in the law. Of course, no surgical team is going to go and retrieve organs from a deceased person in the face of a family that really does not want that to happen. But I think what it has changed is the conversation that's had with the family after someone has sadly died in circumstances where organ donation might be possible the worst day of that family's life. But nevertheless, it opens the way to a conversation around making the loved one's wishes honored and um, allowing organ donation to happen. But it does change the nature of things, doesn't it? What was previously a gift might now be, might now be seen as something taken by the state, like income tax. And not everyone is in favour of it. Indeed, there are people waiting for transplants who are not keen on opt-out. So food for thought in a big way. One of the points made on the video, though, was the importance of having that difficult conversation with your loved ones about what do you want to happen when you die. I grew up in Scotland, and so there's little Lorraine Kelly on Scottish television um, promoting the WeChat, the conversation you have to have around the tea table about what you want to happen. Make sure your family knows, otherwise they can't support your wishes in the face of an awful situation. Now, we talked about imbalance of need around blood. This is even more true when it comes to organs and when it comes to kidneys in particular. Kidney transplantation saves lives. Yes, we have dialysis for patients whose kidneys have failed, but people don't thrive on dialysis. Only a third will be alive after five years of dialysis, whereas after a transplant at five years, 95% will be alive and living fruitful, happy, fulfilled lives. Unfortunately, as you see here on the slide, amongst black and minority ethnic populations, the imbalance is really serious. They comprise 35% of the kidney waiting list due to a greater propensity to high blood pressure and diabetes, two conditions that harm kidneys over the long term. 
And people from those backgrounds uh, still represent only 7% of donors. And so there's quite a lot of education and discussion to be had. The good news is that all the world's major faiths and most of the lesser, smaller faiths uh, support organ donation. And on the NHSBT website, you'll find statements from no fewer than 15 faiths, including humanism, on the position, their position on organ donation. And there are some quotes on this slide from uh, Islamic teachings, from Judaism and Christianity. And you can actually uh, download organ donation cards to carry around that have certain religious symbols on them as appropriate. So the will is there, there are no uh, religious laws that get in the way. But there are many cultural issues around organ donation. And one is the understandable feelings that people have that the deceased's body should still be cared for and should still be respected. In some cultures, of course, burial should take place as quickly as possible. And it's important that we educate and emphasize that organ donation needn't get in the way of that important cultural practice. But people say things like, oh, we don't, we don't think we want him cut open. He's been through such a lot, let him rest in peace. And so donation is sometimes seen as an intrusion on the dignity and respect of the deceased's body. And of course, not, organs, not all organs are the same. Uh, I've never seen a Valentine's card with a pancreas on it. <laughs> I've never read romantic poetry to the kidney. But of course, when you go on the organ donor register as a living person, you can say, well, actually, there are some organs I'd rather not donate and the commonest of those, of course, are eyes and hearts, because again, they are culturally of huge significance. The eyes being the window of the soul and the heart being the seat of love, romantic and brotherly and all other sorts. So there are cultural issues um, there. So finally, um, we come to living kidney donation. Is this taking empathy to the extreme limit? About um, a thousand people in the year give a kidney. But it's very handy, isn't it? We've all got two. So we've got a kidney and a spare. Who are these thousand people? Well, about 750 will be people who donate directly to a relative or a friend. And that all sounds extremely understandable and extremely simple. Well, it's not really. You're going to say yes, hopefully, to your parent or certainly to your child. But what about your uncle's brother-in-law's nephew's sister? Is that a relative? What about that cousin in Australia that you haven't seen since the age of 10? You get an email out of the blue. Who's a friend? We think we know who our friends are. What about people we work with? What if it's the boss? Living donation in, under the law has to take place without, the term is without duress, coercion or reward. The reward could be money or it could be material. So if your boss comes in and says, oh, my little child needs a kidney, when does it become a gift? When does coercion and duress start to come into play? Quite tricky. Sometimes you will have a willing donor, but they're not a very good match. Through NHS blood and transplant, people like that can be matched up with other willing couples to get better matches for both recipients. And you can actually do three couples. But it's a bit like buying and selling houses. You've got a chain, and the chain can sometimes collapse so that someone might give an organ, but their loved one doesn't get one back because the chain has fallen apart for some reason. The most uh, um, interesting uh, living kidney donation, uh, I think, is the altruistic uh, sort. So this is people of whom there are about 100 a year in the UK who turn up and say, I've got a spare kidney, I can live with one. There are all these people on the waiting list. I don't know a person who needs one, but why don't you just take it and use it for the good of somebody? Um, 
and they have no idea who will get the kidney, they have no say in who will get the kidney, they may never know whether it was successful or not. The picture on the right is my absolute favourite living altruistic don donor. Um, I happen to be married to him. Uh, he donated last year, and that's him in his favourite coffee shop, seven days after donating a kidney, sailed through it. And the highlight of our lockdown was the letter he received from his recipient to say that she was transformed, was the word she used. She was off dialysis, she could plan, she could work, she could go on holiday, and what a difference it had made, and thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Recipients of blood, organs, they say thank you all the time. And maybe that's as much a reward as anybody needs and deserves. So, as Mark said, we're very, very happy to take questions and comments. And the email is again at the bottom of this slide. Thank you. Good evening. As I offer a faith perspective on the ethics of organ donation, it is a pleasure to begin with a robust and unequivocal affirmation of the goods of transplant medicine by Pope John Paul II, who, speaking to the Society for Organ Sharing in 1991, said, We should rejoice that medicine in its service to life has found in organ donation a new way of serving the human family, precisely by safeguarding that fundamental good of a person. The free donation of an organ expresses an ethos of giving, even of sacrifice. If there is a fundamental agreement between faith and science on this point, there still remains to be explored the particular circumstances of and methods employed in the process of transplantation, with the acknowledgement that even the greatest good can be perverted and abused. It is precisely because the Christian faith holds the human body sacred as a temple of the Holy Spirit, that it believes that the integrity and dignity of the human body and person must always be respected. Not only must the act of donation not seriously harm the functional integrity of the living body, organ donation should be a free will gesture and not the result of coercion. Unfortunately, there does exist an international market in organs. For the poverty-stricken, the sale of their kidneys for transplantation is a means of earning much-needed money. In China, prisoners of conscience are executed on demand to provide organs for the international market. In other countries, for example the Philippines, criminals, criminal gangs kidnap and murder children and young people for the same purpose. Commercial trade in human organs is illegal in every country other than Iran, but clearly a great deal happens beyond the law. Transplant tourism is also a common phenomenon. Given the existence of this trade, is it difficult to ensure that organs transplanted in this country come from ethical sources? That's a genuine question, I don't know that. But given the demand for organs, there is considerable pressure to make the trade legal in order to contry, try to control the abuses. From a Christian perspective, this would be legitimating the commodification of a human person, an impossibility in ethical terms. The question has been raised whether organ donation should be considered a duty. After all, as Lorna pointed out, each of us has one more kidney than we need to survive. If, however, we proceed on the basis of the need for donation to be a gratuitous gift, then we cannot say that it is something that anyone else has a right to demand. No one has more right to my kidney than I do. There are painful cases where children are be con being conceived expressly to provide an organ to save the life of an older sibling. It is the responsibility of healthcare professionals to ensure that donation is free from external pressure, though how this might be possible in say, such 
painful family situations is hard to conceive. If there are many ethical issues around live donation, those around post-mortem donation are no less fraught. In the United Kingdom, there is no statutory definition of death. In its place, there is an established practice codified in professional guidelines. From 1995, the Conference of Medical Royal Colleges has defined death as the irreversible loss of the capacity for consciousness combined with irreversible loss of the capacity to breathe. It was also stated that irreversible cessation of brainstem function will produce this state and that Therefore, brainstem death is equivalent to the death of an individual. Unfortunately, this is not a universally agreed standard. The criteria used in the United Kingdom are less rigorous than in other jurisdictions, relying on the loss of brainstem function only, while some clinicians argue that other brain functions may continue. In many European countries, the diagnosis of death by neurological criteria includes, as standard, a test to show loss of blood supply to the brain. In terms of supporting grieving families, this can be an important difference. Loss of blood supply can be demonstrated by an angiogram or ultrasound, whereas there is no way for a family to observe loss of brainstem function. In recent times, there has been a renewed interest in obtaining organs for transplantation after death as diagnosed by circulatory or cardiac criteria. In controlled hospital environments, surgical teams can be made ready to step in soon after cardiac function ceases to procure solid organs such as the heart, lungs, liver, and kidneys. With any further delay, these organs will deteriorate so as to become unusable. Thus, an, imported relate, an important related issue is how soon after the, after the cessation of cardiac function it may be permissible to declare death and to remove the organs. How long after a cessation could a patient potentially be resuscitated? If she could be resuscitated successfully after 10 minutes, then clearly she should not be declared dead before that point. But once again, there is no agreed standard on this point, and of course circumstances are always vary. As of 2010, in Italy, Switzerland and Holland, a 10-minute standoff time was observed, whereas in Spain, France and the United Kingdom, the time was five minutes, and in some hospitals in the United States, it was only two minutes. When the demand for organ donation is so intense and when minutes are important concerning the viability or non-viability of organs for transplantation, it's not hard to see that there will be pressure to minimize the standoff time before proceeding to harvest organs. These aren't good circumstances for calm and considered decisions. As the 2014 report of the Roman Catholic Church's On the Ethics of Organ Transplantation document states, diagnosis of death should correspond to an irreversible physiological state, not to a reversible decision by others that it would be convenient to treat someone as though he were dead. Because the circumstances in which such decisions are made will often be traumatic and emotional, it is of the greatest importance that donors should be fully informed about how death is determined, both here and elsewhere, and what the practice of organ retrieval involves, both before and after death, before they give consent. They also need to share those, their views with those close to them, because the working out of donation may have a significant impact on the families and friends as well. For with regard to organ donation, the words after my death do not mean after death in the way that most people understand it. 
It does not mean that they will be permanently without a heartbeat, not breathing, or even certainly unconscious. They and their relations need to be told that they will have a natural heartbeat throughout, will be breathing with the aid of a ventilator, and still so reactive they will have to be paralyzed to enable surgery, and perhaps will be given anesthesia as well. The donor, the donor will not be conscious of, of all this at the time, of course, but to those loved ones wanting to say goodbye, their family member may seem to them anything but dead. In all fairness, those who campaign to encourage organ donation need to be upfront about what is involved in diagnosing death by different criteria or the differences of opinion that exist about such a diagnosis, or that saying goodbye has to happen while the heart still beats and artificial ventilation continues. It's not hard to see why these are not more widely known, because they might make people more reluctant to donate. And these difficulties are acute not only for patients, but also for medical professionals. Before I conclude, I quote from a letter from a retired consultant anaesthetist, Dr. David J. Hill, who had been involved in major organ transplantation. First, he wrote, a very limited selection of doctors was used to diagnose death for transplant purposes. Those, like myself, who could perform the required tests but would not make the diagnosis of death, would not be invited. Second, colleague anaesthetists and the protocol of my department of anaesthesia at the time advocated full general anaesthesia for the organ donor, although he or she had been diagnosed as dead. Third, theater registers would sometimes record the time of death of the donor as the time when the ventilator was turned off at the end of the procedure. Clearly, some theater, pro theater personnel involved in the organ procurement operation did not regard the donor as dead at the commencement of the donor operation. Organ donation is indeed, as the Catechism of the Catholic Church states, a noble and meritorious act and is to be encouraged as an expression of generous solidarity. Whether deemed consent actually reflects the level of understanding of the general public of what is involved in post-mortem donation is, however, much more open to debate. Thank you. So I think we've, well, from all three of you, had some really stimulating talks. And I, and I think the thing that, that seems to me that is common there is that we're, we're dealing here with some really sensitive issues, whether we're coming from it, coming at it from a faith perspective or, or from a medical science uh, perspective. And I think, as we've so often said before, really we're, we're all wanting the same thing, aren't we? We're all into the best for people, but actually it's deciding how you get the best for people in the end. Um, so I don't know whether we might actually just start by thinking about some of those, some of those questions really about, perhaps about the gift idea and versus you know being coerced into to, to giving up a, a an organ or even coerced into giving blood or just maybe it's a sort of starter I think picking up on something that Peter said about saviour children um, firstly I think they tend to be uh, to donate bone marrow which is replaceable rather than whole organs but the thing that uh, always I wonder is how the saved child the the, the child who was born first who needed the saviour sibling feels because for the rest of their life they will feel indebted to their sibling. Mm -hmm. and, and it's obvious from what Lorna said about the recipient of her husband's kidney that that was something that was received in the, in the same spirit to which it was given. But maybe for a saved child from a saviour sibling that is not a choice they were offered. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a uh, I think we sometimes forget how the don how the recipients feel as well as the donors. Yeah. Yeah, one of the things one occasionally sees in the case of um, living kidney donation within families is that um, a child 
a grown-up child will be very keen to donate to their father or mother, but to the parent that feels all the wrong way around. And they are often very reluctant to accept a donation from their grown-up son or daughter. And you always get to the point where you wonder if the donor is being a bit coercive towards the recipient, because they know you must take my kid, you must. <laughs> you must. <laughs> uh, and, and so it can occasionally flip the other way round. Um, is, it, is it generally safer or easier for, for a donation to be a anonymous, really, so that there's, there's kind of a, a interfamilial tensions don't have a, a chance to, to offer? Um, I don't know. I think, I think most of the time it's fine. Mm -hmm. and, but people, you're right, people are enormously grateful even you know, to, a, to a loved one within the family. You know, imagine them doing this for me. Imagine my sister doing this for me. Imagine my brother doing this for me. And it brings people together. Um, uh, and, and friendships that have sometimes been long standing become even closer. Now, of course, the great fear is that the organ won't work. And of course, the medical term can be rejection, the organ rejected by the recipient's immune system. And that's a loaded word again, isn't it? But it's not that the donor is being rejected as a person. So there has to be quite a lot of emotional support for a living donor whose organ doesn't work in the recipient, because it's very traumatic. Mm -hmm. It was interesting that as Peter talked and as you've just said that, it made me reflect on what I was saying about how people were almost judgmental about giving a liver to an alcoholic, but maybe in reflection what it is is they don't want the organ to go to waste. It's not about, I don't want the alcohol to have it because of their past, it's because I want the maximum good to come out of my donation. Yes. And, and perhaps it's that, you know, it is a big issue and you don't want to feel that it's somehow wasted. Mm, exactly. But I suppose actually that if, if, if you make a gift of something, in a, in a way, you sh if it's a real gift, you shouldn't really mind too much how yeah. <laughs> what, yes. what happens to it. No yes. strings attached. No, yeah, yes, yes. But, uh, but I, well, I, could see what, I could see exactly what you're saying. Yeah. I mean, I wonder if we could move on. Some of the questions that, that, that Peter was raising about, you know, how we define when somebody's actually dead. And the, and the great sensitivity are, around that. I mean, do, do you want, uh, again, as as the medical people to respond to that a, a, a little bit in terms of you know how it how it does actually work out in the end because again I mean I, I think we've all come across wonderful stories really of you know somebody who's lost a loved one in really tragic circumstances and actually the thought that their their loved one has given new life to somebody else has been a comfort to them um, but but one can also imagine at the time when that's you know you're faced with that is such a such a difficult one isn't it well, it's, it's, huge, it's hugely difficult, and I think the, the way the guidance has, has grown up over decades with huge amounts of discussion over every tiny change to professional guidance, uh, I think I can be pretty reassuring that both as a profession and as medical individuals, no one is ever going to take any risk in proceeding you know, if there's any question about could the person recover, is, if there's any question about are the family really supportive of this, then they will not proceed. And that's why so many possible trans, uh, possible uh, organ donations actually don't happen because not everyone is fully happy with, with the situation. And the Peter raised a very interesting question, I think, about how much information people would want. Clearly, if you're a living donor, you need to know everything about the surgery. Uh, it's mostly keyhole, by the way, so it's, it's, it's a much less invasive procedure than it once was. But for living people going on the register to, to uh, agree to donation after death, I don't know how much information people really want when you're 25 and you think this will happen when I'm 70. You know, it'll be different by then anyway. And similarly, a traumatised family 
we were once uh, we once had a complaint actually from um, a medically qualified person whose husband had had died, and there was discussion about organ donation. And she felt she had been given far too much detail, far too much information um, at a very traumatic time, and. Even as a medically qualified person, she said, I was not capable of taking that in. Mm -hmm. And so actually she came and worked with us uh, some months later to help simplify some of that information mm -hmm. um, and make it kind of what people could take in, understand well enough to consent, but not bog them down with, with too much medical detail. But it's a hugely difficult balance mm -hmm. to strike. The issue of consent in medicine, we're just moving away from the donation thing, the issue of consent in medicine is massive. Um, and it's one of the things that, from my ethical point of view, I've always felt you should have the right to consent without information. Yes, just do it, but I don't want I don't all want of that know. information. I don't want to know. Yes. I, I, I had this when I had a, a procedure myself. I, I actually said to the physician, I really don't care. If I didn't think you were going to be capable of doing the job, I wouldn't have asked you to do it. So don't bother me with the detail. Yeah. I'm not in the right frame of mind to accept it. And I think that particularly in the horrendous aftermath of the kind of death which gives the possibility of cadaveric donation, you really, you don't want the emotional discussion of what's going to happen. Right. Yeah, um, right. And, and it, one of the things we haven't said is, of course, um, as Peter said, you know, the five, ten minute at the most standoff period for a heart, in the case of eyes and bone and skin even, that might be 24 hours. Yeah. And when I was uh, under the Human Tissue Act, you have a response of an individual within each hospital. And the only donation-related question I ever, uh, complaint I ever received as a, as a designated individual was from somebody who was unhappy at the collection of her mother's eyes for donation, mm -hmm. which had taken place 20 hours after she died with full consent from her husband. Um, and it's that, it is, it comes back to this, you know, the eyes of the window of the soul, and, mm -hmm. you know, I've never seen my heart, or I've never seen my wife's heart, so I don't really have an emotional <laughs> attachment to it in the same way as I do to our eyes. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but people also um, have understandable misconceptions, so of course an eye donation, it's not the whole eye, it's the clear cornea at the front of the eye, mm -hmm. but people sometimes assume that the recipient's eye will, will change colour, you know, it will be the colour of the donor and they will still start to begin to look like the donor. So none of this is true but unless we explain this very carefully, people might assume uh, things that are, that are very emotionally challenging but are actually not correct. It, it's perhaps telling that this is something which is, the whole human race is something which is beloved by fiction writers. I remember yes, once reading yes. a particularly horrifying short story um, about somebody who received a donor's eyes and began to see the things that they'd seen, mm -hmm. and likewise acquiring a heart. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's somehow the idea that your personality, particularly in the case of the heart, is mm -hmm. embedded in your heart. Mm -hmm. So part of the challenge is, is knowing when more information is, is helpful and when it's not helpful. Yeah. 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 And, as a question to Jane and Peter particularly, um, this is the sort of thing where I feel that it's a, a real problem potentially for vicars, particularly people in this kind of you know interaction with their parishioners. Is this the kind of thing people come and talk to you about? Mm -hmm. Well, no, they have. I mean, I, that's not something I've had to, to, to confront. I have to admit, but um, it's, no, it's I can imagine. Yes, yeah, so I'm. Uh, I don't think it is something that I particularly found myself in conversation with people mm. about, really, not at a personal level. I think it's much, it tends to happen much more at this kind of level, that people are, are very interested in the ethics of it all. Um, and, and I suppose one of the, perhaps in terms of, 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 of drawing some sort of conclusion, I just thought that the, you know, you, you were opening things today about, um, in a sense, this, at the moment, in, in this country, anyway, things are, it, it's definitely done through gifts and not because people get paid. And I wonder whether, whether we have a view of that in the sense that, a view about it rather, that, that actually that's always going to be the best, the best way of doing it, that it is actually, people do it out of 
altruism rather than actually because it would earn them some money or, or, or whatever. I just wonder if you have got a personal view about that. Well, the UK, I mean, the, the, yes, the, the culture in the UK has been very f focused on altruistic, the notion of blood, of bone marrow, of organs. And, and um, the organs, I think, are at the extreme end of what people might consider they would wish to be paid for. I mean, <coughs> um, Mark mentioned the, the paid plasma industry globally. Well, that doesn't, it's not run in the UK like, like that. Um, so I think it would be a very long time before the UK ever would even consider payment for, for organs. Mm -hmm. um, because the, the pace at which society changes on these things is very slow and very measured, and it has, it has to be. So the law has now, of course, is allowing deemed consent. And I think we have to let that settle into society for a number of years and see what see what happens. I, I think personally, unequivocally, I think altruistic donation of organs is the is the only morally acceptable way of doing it. I'm always terrified of the idea as Peter said, if you go over if you consider the Philippines where it's possible to have private donations, the idea that the developed wealthy countries of the Western world could have a, an organ colonialism the way we had a colonialism of resource a hundred years ago. So we went to Africa for a donation because people sold them because it was their only way of survival. That would be wholly and completely unacceptable on any moral, ethical or religious level. Um, and so now I think altruistic donation of organs is the only way forward. Blood, I, I kind of suppose I'm a real world pragmatist, and maybe we do have to consider the possibility that in order to maintain the supply in the face of a grazing army, and I too am you know, part of the aging end of the population, <laughs> it may be necessary. Anyway, well, I think we probably ought to wrap up there, but can I say a, a huge thank you um, to, to all three of you for what you've contributed tonight. And, and to just remind those of you that are, are, are watching this, that please, if you want to join in with this debate or send in questions, um, to send them to scienceatcathedral.org.uk um, and uh, we'll mark, we'll respond. Um, and also to, to say that there will be another one of these uh, sessions um, in a couple of weeks' time, on the week beginning the 16th of November, um, when we're going to be focusing on human tissue research. Uh, so please do join us again then. <laughs>